After 10 months of flying in space, NASA's double asteroid redirection test, the world's first planetary defense technology demonstration, successfully impacted its asteroid target on September 26. The double asteroid redirection test, or DART, was launched atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket on 24 November 2021 from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. DART's target was the asteroid Moonlit Dimorphos, a small body just 160 meters in diameter, orbiting a larger 780-meter asteroid called Didymos, located 11 million kilometers from Earth. The final approach of DART to Dimorphos on Monday appeared to go as planned, with no issues reported by controllers. The 570-kilogram spacecraft was able to lock autonomously onto Dimorphos while flying at a whopping speed of 22,530 km per hour. As DART approached Dimorphos, the asteroid transformed from a mysterious bright dot into a detailed landscape of boulders, crags, and shadowed terrain. The spacecraft's primary camera beamed a photo to Earth every second until the feed went black as the spacecraft crashed into the asteroid. DART's CubeSat companion, Light Italian CubeSat for imaging of asteroids or Lichia Cube, was deployed from the spacecraft 15 days before the impact. The CubeSat was designed to capture images of DART's impact and the asteroid's resulting cloud of ejected matter. The images are intended to provide a view of the collision's effects to help researchers better characterize the effectiveness of kinetic impact in deflecting an asteroid. The impact was also witnessed by telescopes on Earth and in space, with some initial reports of a plume of ejecta from the impact visible on ground-based telescopes. One of the key goals of the kinetic impact test is to precisely measure how much the asteroid was deflected. Researchers estimate the impact to shorten Dimorpho's orbit by about 1%, or roughly 10 minutes. Over the coming weeks, scientists will characterize the ejecta produced and precisely measure Dimorpho's orbital change to determine how effectively DART deflected the asteroid. The results will help plan any future asteroid deflection missions. Roughly four years from now, the European Space Agency's HERA project will conduct detailed surveys of both Dimorphos and Didymos, with a particular focus on the crater left by DART's collision and precise measurement of Dimorphos' mass. NASA moved the Space Launch System Moon rocket back into its vehicle assembly building on September 27 to take shelter from the Ian hurricane, gusting at up to 240 km per hour. NASA had hoped the storm's track through the Gulf would take it sufficiently westwards so that the rocket could stay out on the pad. But the track shifted eastwards on Monday, forcing NASA to roll back the integrated rocket to protect it from the hurricane. The 98-meter-tall Mega Moon rocket with the Orion capsule stacked atop arrived in the vehicle assembly building on Tuesday morning, wrapping up a nearly 11-hour journey from Launch Complex 39B. A few hours after the arrival of the SLS rocket, a small fire broke out inside the assembly building. Kennedy Space Center officials tweeted that the employees were evacuated immediately after the fire was discovered and the Artemis 1 vehicle was not in danger. The source of the fire was later found to be a 40-volt electrical panel on the wall of the vehicle assembly building High Bay No. 3. According to NASA officials, the agency is planning to conduct work on the SLS rocket in the coming weeks, replacing components that have a limited lifespan. Moreover, teams will swap out batteries on the flight termination system, which range safety teams would use to destroy the launch vehicle if it veers off course after liftoff. The next potential Artemis 1 launch windows are October 17 to 31, and then November 12 to 27. The Ian hurricane also delayed the launch of SpaceX's Crew-5 astronaut mission to the International Space Station. SpaceX and NASA had been planning to launch the mission on October 3 from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center but the threat of Ian has delayed the planned liftoff to October 5. The Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon capsule that will fly on Crew-5 are currently safe inside SpaceX's hangar at Pad 39A. The Crew-5 will send NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Kasada, Japan's Koichi Wakata, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kakina to the International Space Station for a five-month stay. It will mark the first time a cosmonaut has flown to the orbiting lab on a private American spacecraft. United Launch Alliance had planned to launch their Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 41 on September 30 on a mission to send two SES telecommunications satellites to geostationary transfer orbit. ULA called off the launch on Tuesday after the hurricane's path shifted significantly and secured the launch vehicle within the vehicle integration facility at Launch Complex 41. The Atlas V rocket is currently planned to launch no earlier than October 4. NASA announced on September 29 that they had signed an agreement to conduct a study to evaluate if one of SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsules could be used to raise the altitude of the Hubble Space Telescope, potentially further extending the lifetime of the 32-year-old instrument. 
SpaceX approached NASA a few months ago and proposed this study to better understand the technical challenges associated with servicing missions. The study, which will collect technical data from both Hubble and the Dragon spacecraft, is expected to take up to six months. This data will help determine whether it would be possible to safely rendezvous, dock, and move the telescope into a more stable orbit. The study will also look into whether an autonomous uncrewed Dragon spacecraft could carry out a Hubble service mission, instead of requiring a crew on board. The project appears to be part of the Polaris program, a private space flight program led by billionaire Jared Isaacman, who flew to space on the Inspiration4 mission. According to Isaacman, he and SpaceX are willing to undertake a Hubble servicing mission with little or no potential cost to the government. Hubble has been operating since 1990, about 540 kilometers above Earth in an orbit that is slowly decaying over time. The space telescope is not in immediate danger of falling out of the sky, but its orbit is expected to have plummeted sufficiently by mid-2030s, and NASA may have to begin arrangements to guide its re-entry and destruction. Reboosting Hubble into a 600 km orbit could help extend the telescope's life into the 2050s. United Launch Alliance launched a classified National Reconnaissance Office spy satellite on a Delta IV heavy rocket on September 24 from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The mission, dubbed NROL-91, was Delta IV's final mission from the U.S. West Coast. The two-stage rocket, which is the world's second-highest capacity launch vehicle in operation behind SpaceX's Falcon Heavy, uses liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as propellants. The vehicle has flown 43 missions overall, and 14 in the heavy configuration, which debuted in 2004. At the request of the National Reconnaissance Office, United Launch Alliance ended the webcast nearly seven minutes into the flight on Saturday. The agency later confirmed in a news release that the mission was successful. Very little is known about the classified payload that went up on the mission and the orbit the satellite will occupy. NRO satellites primarily collect optical and radar imagery, intercept radio transmissions, and gather intelligence data for the U.S. government. United Launch Alliance is under contract to launch two more NRO satellites in 2023 and 2024, but these will launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida. ULA then plans to retire the Delta IV Heavy and replace it with the new Vulcan Centaur rocket. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Last week was a no-test week for SpaceX at Starbase. No attempt was made to perform any sort of test at Boca Chica, and the road remained open all week. A week without tests allowed SpaceX engineers at the launch site to continue upgrading the orbital launch mount without any break. Teams were seen working on the launch mount installing blast shielding to safeguard the interior of the structure. The shielding will keep the fire from entering the launch mount through the side of the super heavy booster hold down clamps. The ongoing upgrades will fully equip the orbital launch mount for the full stack 33 engine static fire test. Since the orbital launch mount work is still pending, SpaceX has not yet placed super heavy booster aid on top of the launch mount for cryo proof tests. Starship 24 was lifted from suborbital pad B and placed on top of a self propelled modular transporter on Friday morning. Now that Ship 24 has completed ground testing, a full stack with Booster 7 will hopefully happen within a month. On September 26, SpaceX attached Super Heavy Booster 7 to two bridge cranes inside the wide bay. Two cranes with load capacities of 150 tons each are required to lift a booster that has a dry mass of about 200 tons. Lifting the booster with the crane will make it easier for SpaceX teams to inspect the inner engines and replace some of them if necessary. Elon Musk recently gave American television host, comedian, and writer Jay Leno an exclusive tour of the Starbase factory. Let's discuss the major takeaways from the interview. Elon Musk revealed that the current plan is to build a Starship and a super heavy booster every month before moving to a more ambitious goal of building one every three days in the next few years. Eventually, SpaceX hopes to have a fleet of 1,000 rockets that can successfully travel back and forth to Mars. Musk estimates that if SpaceX is able to put 100 people on each ship, they can send a million people to the Red Planet in 20 years to create a self-sustaining city. But he added that it would take Starship up to 100 successful flights before it could carry any human to space. According to Musk, it currently costs more than a billion dollars to send a ton of payload to Mars. However, reusable Starship spacecraft could reduce this by a factor of 10,000, which would be equal to $100,000 per ton. When Leno asked Musk if there was a particular Starship achievement he was most proud of, Musk replied that building a rocket out of stainless steel was the most counterintuitive thing. When asked if SpaceX had a patent on the material used to build its ships, Musk stated that SpaceX does not patent things and that patents are for the weak. No, we don't really patent things. 
Oh, really? No. I don't care about patents. So you, patents you... are for the weak. And, you know, the problem is like patents are generally used as a blocking technique. They don't actually help advance things. They just stop others from following you. Um, and most, most patents are, are, are BS. Yeah. Musk concluded the interview by saying that having too many rules and regulations will stop innovation and will ultimately limit the advancement of civilization. Too many rules and regulations basically stopping uh, innovation and, and actually ultimately limiting the advancement of civilization. You may watch the complete Elon Musk J. Leno interview from the link provided in the description. At Starbase, on September 26, teams moved the aft section of Super Heavy Booster 9 from a production tent into the wide bay. You can see the oxygen header tank of the booster inside the aft section, also the booster quick disconnect panel on the exterior. The booster quick disconnect mechanism on the orbital launch mount attaches to this panel to supply propellants and electrical power required by the booster. The 20 ring oxygen tank section of booster 9 was lifted and placed atop the aft section on September 27, completing the oxygen tank stacking operations. Booster 9's basic structure will be completed once the methane tank section is stacked atop the oxygen tank section. In July, Musk tweeted that future Raptor engines would have electric thrust vector control systems. Booster 9 could be the first to receive Raptor V2 engines equipped with electric thrust vector control systems. The nose cone barrel section of Starship 26 was moved into the high bay on Wednesday morning. This payload bay section does not have a satellite dispenser fitted in it, meaning SpaceX might not deploy any Starlink satellites during the orbital flight of Ship 26. The nose cone of Ship 26 was moved into the high bay on Wednesday afternoon, but it was later moved back to the production yard for some unknown reason. SpaceX is preparing a Starship aft dome test tank for structural stress tests. The test tank was mounted on the can crusher test stand on September 26. The cap of the test stand was lifted with the help of a crane and placed on the test tank the next day. During the structural test, 20 cables that extend from the cap to the hydraulic rams of the test stand will squeeze the test tank filled with liquid nitrogen to test its structural integrity. The test tank has strange white parts added to its exterior, this could be a test structure designed to test the strength of the hinges of the aft flaps. SpaceX is building a new test facility at Massey's, a site approximately 7.5 kilometers away from the Starbase build site and 10.7 kilometers from the launch site. The 1.2 kilometers road leading up to this property from Highway No. 4 is owned by SpaceX, so no road closure is required for tests at this site. The E-Dome and Booster 7.1 test tanks that left the Starbase build site on September 22 were moved to this location. On Friday morning, SpaceX conducted a cryo-proof test of the E-Dome test tank at Massey's. The test tank is designed to validate the new flatter Starship propellant tank dome. Friday's test ended with an intentional explosion of the test tank. By doing so, SpaceX could be able to determine the maximum pressure the test tank can withstand. Earlier this year, NASA raised concerns about the risks of launching Starship rockets close to Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A, the only pad available for Crew Dragon missions. As a result of this, SpaceX is now modifying its Cape Canaveral Space Force Station Launch Complex 40 for Dragon missions. There is a good chance that NASA will require the backup Dragon launch pad at Launch Complex 40 to be fully ready before SpaceX is allowed to launch Starship from Pad 39A. Moreover, William H. Gerstenmayer, vice president of the Build and Flight Reliability team at SpaceX, recently said in a media teleconference that Starship would come to launch pad 39A only after it is proven reliable at Starbase. We've already started the work to begin the preparation for pad 40. We've actually ordered some hardware, put some contract stuff in place, and, and we're ready to go have a crew capability at pad 40. Our intent is to bring Starship to 39A after we have a reliable vehicle, and we'll do a series of tests down in Boca, make sure the vehicle's ready to go, and when we think we've got a very good and reliable vehicle, then we'll bring it to 39A and, and launch. And we With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.